What's up, everybody? Man, uh, I am so thrilled uh, to share this episode with you. Sarah Miltenberger is making climate cool again. Uh, it's, it's always fun to interview other podcast hosts and kind of hear about their story. And there's not many of us out there, right? There's not a whole lot of like packaging or sustainability podcast people. So it was super awesome uh, to be able to chat with Sarah. Uh, I think the interview is super educational, super beneficial, especially if you care about sustainability. Uh, you can go to makeclimatecool.com, Make climatecool.com and connect up with Sarah. She's doing some incredible work and she is here to help you and your company understand and hit your goals. You don't want to miss this interview with Sarah, so let's get to it. All right, everybody. I am here finally with Sarah <laughs> Miltenberger. Uh, Sarah and I connected up on Clubhouse. It was Clubhouse, right? That's where we... I think so. We yeah. Birthed, probably. Um, and that's been when in, a, doubt. when in doubt, go with Clubhouse, I guess. <laughs> it's such a new social channel too. I just don't really, I haven't gotten in my groove. You, you seem like you've maybe gotten in a little bit more of a Clubhouse groove. Like I sort of show up for an hour and then I don't, I forget that it's even there, but some people like are getting a ton of value out of it. So we can talk about it, but are, are do you, do you get a lot of value out of Clubhouse? I definitely did in the first few months of kind of Clubhouse being launched in the US. I would say like starting end of Jan, early February, I think is around when I started. Yeah. And I think, remember, we're like almost a year into COVID isolation. I'm like, give me people or give I know, me right? death. I, I don't know. know. <laughs> That's so true. <laughs> and, and so I just leaned so hard into it. I was spending like five hours a week just talking to people from all over the world. And again, it goes back to like when in doubt clubhouse, right? Because there's so many people that are just like coming in, coming out, listening for blurbs, like kind of yeah. listening on their own time. You get to kind of leave quietly as they say. And, and so I just found up until about a month ago, I was just thriving. And then lately, I think with just going back into the real world. And as you know, as a podcaster, right? That amount of live interaction is, is very uh, draining. So yeah. I kind of have to like, go back and forth uh, with it, but. No doubt. Well, Sarah, you should probably introduce yourself other than a person <laughs> who who met me on Clubhouse. So uh, I, I won't do you justice. I could obviously read your LinkedIn profile, but you probably can do a much better job introducing yourself. Uh, you, you do a ton of work in sustainability. You do it, you're, you host a podcast. You're obviously on Clubhouse. Uh, you know, where are you located? And what's kind of your, I don't want to say your thing, because as we were talking pre-call, you're like sort of a jack of all trades, master of none sometimes, you know, like we just, I feel the same way, Don't by tell the my way. clients that. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean, I feel the same way. Like, I feel like I know, I know enough about a lot of stuff, which is a really valuable skill in my opinion. You know what I mean? So um, anyway, why don't you kind of dive in a little bit to who you are and what you do? Well, thank you. Um, yes, my name is Sarah Miltenberger and I uh, live in Connecticut now, but I've lived in a lot of places. I would say I'm also kind of a city person, but I grew up in like a rural town, which I think really helped shape who I am now in the sense that I do work in sustainability consulting. So, and, I, and people are like, well, what the heck is that even? Um, because there's a difference between sustainability. There's a difference between like an environmentalist. There's a difference between a conservationist. We all kind of have our own types. But I think for me, I'm really focused on humans and the in the fact that, you know, we're on this planet, we're going to consume stuff. So let's make that stuff the best it can be for us and for the planet together, like try to live a little bit more symbiotically i think that's the right word it is um, <laughs> i'm pretty sure <laughs> we'll just go with it but uh but yeah i've been doing i've had my own business for two over two years now it's crazy i think i've worked for myself longer than i've worked for anybody else over yeah, over years almost three and uh and I used to work for Tesla. I worked in tech. I worked for like a really cool hot startup, Delos, which is kind of blowing up right now in like the built environment, building world. And I just have a real passion for people and product and making things better for the planet. So 
And, and what's your, yeah, what's oh, your podcast ahead. name? That's what I was going to ask. It's called Make Climate Cool Again. <laughs> I almost forgot about that. Um, no, and I think, you know, where that podcast started was, you know, I was looking for jobs for a while and I was like, man, I'm networking with all these amazing people in sustainability that are doing so many cool things. I wish I could just like record this and share it. And of course, like that's what podcasting is. So I was like, okay, I'm just going to start recording these conversations. And after a little while, I'm like, wow, these are inspiring stories. I don't know why, like, why do we even talk about climate change in such a negative way when there's so much hope and there's so much positivity out there? Like, let's completely flip the script on this thing and let's have fun with it. Let's make climate cool again, you know? And, and that yeah. was really like the whole vibe of the podcast. I like the double word play also. On, Absolutely. Yeah, it's, Absolutely. it's great. It's great. Uh, that, yeah, there, it's funny. There was a guy that I knew, um, it, it's, it's sort of related, but unrelated. And he really wanted to be a chief marketing officer, but he had very little experience in marketing. And so what he did is he just started interviewing CMOs. And he wrote a book about the marketing officers and the book started to sell and he learned a ton and networked a ton and probably at the time he could have started a podcast on it as well and taken all these interviews and ended up becoming a chief marketing officer not because he you know worked his way through but because he just said i want to go talk to the coolest people and you know it turns out you learn a lot i've, I've learned so much from this podcast talking with people in the industry, whether it's engineers or designers or brand owners or sustainability consultants or what have you, right? I just, I love it because I just get to learn from really cool people and, and kind of share their stories. And that's kind of what we're all about over here at the People of Packaging. So we're, we're <laughs> yeah, super stoked no, to have you it. on. Uh, it's Thanks. great. I, and... I would probably do it full time, honestly, like just interviewing people would be great. Oh my gosh, for sure. And I think you know, like you said, the greatest lessons I feel like I've learned are not necessarily ones I've experienced myself, but from stories that I've either listened to or, you know, uh, had had conversations with people. And so I think that, I mean, you can use, I mean, I, I listen to, you know, it's almost like the equivalent of shitty TV, <laughs> but like, you know, kind of like eh, podcasts, but like, I find them to be interesting, but they're just gossip or something. <laughs> but so you could also like learn something from podcasts too, which is really, so you gotta have like a balance. You gotta have like your, your potato chip podcast. You gotta have your, your celery yeah. podcast too, you know? Yeah, totally. I listen to podcasts on like theology, politics, and the Denver Nuggets. Like it, it, <laughs> And, and, and I love the Denver Nuggets, but you're right. Like, I don't, I don't personally benefit. It's just sort of like fun entertainment. They do a good job with it and I enjoy it, but it's not like I'm, you know, leveling up my career because I know what the Nuggets prognosticate will be their 26th pick in the 2021 draft, but I'm really interested and I kind of want to know. So I totally agree with you. Uh, so I got, I do have a question on your LinkedIn profile. It says Forbes under 30 scholar. Yeah. What does that mean? Cause it sounds really cool. So <laughs> was that, did they come and, and they were like, Sarah, hi Forbes, we want to nominate you. Or did you go through a process or did somebody say, Hey Sarah, I think you should apply for this. You're doing some really cool stuff. And you're like, yeah, that sounds great. Like what's that process like? That's pretty much how it was that last one. It was, okay. I kind of had heard about it and it's, it's only for students. So I was in grad school at the time at Columbia and you apply for it. You have to, I think there's a referral process as well. Like you have to get some kind of recommendation and then they pick you out of, it's like a thousand people a year. Um, so it's like quite a large group. Um, but I don't know how many people actually apply. It's probably a decent number. Um, yeah. And then you get to go to the Forbes under 30 under 30 summit, which cool. was awesome. It's, I think it's one of the best conferences I've ever been to partly because like chain smokers performed and like all these like amazing people were there, like speakers, all the 30 under 30 people. Oak. I mean, only like one of the best conferences ever highly recommend if you are down to go to Detroit in the fall got it uh to tell you my age a little bit when you said cane smokers performed I was honestly like 
what would chain smoking people perform? And then my brain was like, no, I'm pretty sure that's a band. I'm like, oh. Oh. <laughs> but that was literally my first thought because I'm like a child of the 90s and I still sort of like live in like 90s and early to mid 2000s mm -hmm. music. And so I'm outside of like, I would, you know, Kanye and Kendrick and J. Cole and that kind of crew of hip hop artists. I just don't know much at all about it. even even like relatively current music from like 10 years ago. <laughs> so anyway, I just thought it was funny. We're like chain smokers performed. I'm like, was it like a barbershop quartet of people who have ruined their lungs? <laughs> well, they actually, I think they performed because they were Forbes 30 under 30. Oh, that's like, awesome. So like they, they have all these different, I mean, they don't just pick 30 people. There's not actually 30 people under 30. It's like 30 people in like all these different sectors. So there's actually probably close to a couple hundred people that get this award per year. Um, it's just like, what are you classified as? So like in the music industry, chain smokers got it. There were a couple other people that got it that performed. I'm like kind of blanking and I feel bad. It's fine. Um, there was like a lot of big names, but again, I'm like you, I kind of like know what I like and I s stick to it. Yeah. I don't even listen to the Apple like newest music anymore. Cause I'm like, I don't even know what this is. I feel so out of the loop. I know I'm like Clint Eastwood, get off my lawn guy sometimes <laughs> with music. And I feel like back in the day. Yeah, right. let me tell you about oh. De La Soul, kids. Let me tell you, like, I've just become that guy. Adam, I had a, a humbling moment. I was um, I was on site for a client recently and we're like, talking about solar power for this, for this client and I was talking to a contractor and the contractor is probably twice my age. Like he's definitely older than me, um, gray hair. Uh, and... I mentioned how I used to work at Tesla and I was, I said something about like how back in the day Tesla used to do X, Y, Z. And <laughs> I was there in 2018, which was like the most tumultuous Tesla year when there was a tent outside where they were, you know, I was literally there. I saw all that go down when they put the tent up and they were like manufacturing cars under a tent. It was crazy. But the fact that I said back in the day, like was hilarious to these two older dudes. They, they're like, this kid is like 20. I'm, I'm actually 28, but they thought I was the funniest person ever. And back I was like, any, wow. anytime you say like back in the day, Tesla, it's like, even though Tesla has been around, they've been making cars for what, eight, nine years now or longer. I mean, a little longer. Yeah. I think 2007 yeah. is when they like actually formally got together, but got it. Yeah. I mean, so it's not like it, they started last year, but it still feels like this very new thing, right? Um, so I, I want to ask you a few questions about your, you're a sustainability consultant and, and I do think in order to be an effective consultant, especially in a topic as broad as sustainability, you do need to know a lot about solar energy versus coal energy. You know, you need to know about, uh, whatever the, the you know, water usage and, you know, these sort of things that impact the, all, all the things that impact the environment. Um, we get asked a lot about sustainability with packaging on, on the show. It's probably the thing that people ask us for the most is, hey, can you have people help me connect with people who can, you know, drive LCAs for sustainability? Where can we validate claims about our, about our packaging? So from your perspective, I guess, number one, is, is that a thing that you're like, yeah, I do this. I mean, if if you're a brand or somebody looking out, I mean, you, you can give yourself a plug that that's a thing that you would do, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I talk about packaging all the time because there's, you know, there's so many different kinds of packaging. There's primary packaging, there's secondary packaging. All of that is part of a product's footprint and all of that I touch. And I do a lot of research on materials and how to communicate it with clients in terms of, right? Because greenwashing is a huge liability. You do not want to say the wrong thing. Everything I do is like backed by science. So, but like that in itself is very confusing for packaging companies in terms of how I say it, what's actually green? What is everyone's giving me stress about biodegradable? What is biodegradable? Is that even a thing? And walking them through, okay, yes, we can say that. No, we cannot. You can feel comfortable and confident in, uh, in talking about this to consumers. 
So yes, yeah. I do. Okay, that's that. that's great to know. So what do you think is one thing? So let's say that you you're given this megaphone and there's a there's a, a camera facing you and they give you the megaphone and they're like, you are talking to every major packaging decision maker right now. It, simultaneously, you can tell everybody who makes packaging uh, uh, one, two, or three things that you just wish, like you could shout out from a megaphone and be like, why don't you understand this? Or why can't you just do this? What would be what, what would be some of those things that just sort of drive you crazy about people in our, in, whether it's engineers or packaging designers, graphic designers that you're running into, or, or even you just see as a consumer with a sustainability focused lens? Tough question. Um, I would say the one major thing would be, you know, something that happens a lot is you just say a blanket statement. I want to be sustainable. Okay. The problem is, it's like, what does that mean? Because that can mean a lot of different things. And ultimately, if you want to be sustainable there, you have to compromise on something, either it's price or it's design or it's something that might you're going to benefit, but you're also going to like kind of hurt a little bit. So I really, my question has always been, okay, what is your priority in sustainability? Is it the material itself? Is it the fact that it's recyclable? Is it the fact that it's something certified? Is it the, you know, what is it that you really want to capture in terms of sustainability very specifically that we can then drive towards and then like, there's other things that can always follow. We can always make something better, but i always want to know like, what is the very specific goal that you want to say to a consumer that like, this is certified or, you know, this yeah. is compostable. Yeah. Dev, I mean, you're, you are definitively preaching to the choir as, <laughs> as, as, as like a packaging professional, we do hear that it's almost like, we need to stop asking people if they want to be sustainable because everybody at, at some level desires sustainability. It may not be environmental sustainability. It may be financial sustainability. It may be brand sustainability. It, and, and maybe they're willing to make sacrifices to financial sustainability in order to, to have better environmental sustainability. But it's such a broad stroke, this word that... I completely agree. It's like, well, we need to really pare this thing down. It would be like showing up at a car dealership and like, what are you looking for? And you're like, a car, something that <laughs> drives. Drives. <laughs> or you go to the airport and they're like, where do you want to go? Oh, on a plane. I'm at the airport. <laughs> like, okay, but where? Like, what time do you need to be there? I don't really, I don't know. I, you know, like, you vague thing that's like, yeah, you can yeah. just get on a plane, but if you don't know where you're going, if you don't have a reason to get there, then, you know, why are you going to buy the ticket? So I, I, I totally get that sense and, and I'm in complete agreement with you that brands who want to get into, you know, communicating sustainability and connecting with their consumers around sustainability really, A, would do well to engage um, engineers and would do well to engage people like yourself who are third-party consultants because like I work for a manufacturer of packaging and I will say this with just complete honesty which is at the end of the day a packaging manufacturer wants you to buy their stuff <laughs> and 100%. and there are great people I work with incredible people and it's not like hey we're, we're not gonna uh, we're not trying to willingly lead you down the wrong path but having a third party person or a company who can come in and be completely agnostic to material, completely agnostic to supply chain, and is just there is so valuable. And it's valuable for the vendors as well, honestly, because we know that we have been vetted and we have been brought in because it's because it's definitively the right thing to do by the by the consumer. Um, I, I mean, I used to be in supply chain for packaging. Yeah. And if you've ever got, like, you go to like Pack Expo or, you know, Westpac or any of these shows, Lux Pack. Have you ever been to any of these? Lux Pack. You did, you've been to Lux Pack? Oh, did you? Sorry there. No, it's fine. Lux Pack. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I'm speaking there actually this year uh, in October. Oh. So that'll be wait. fun. 
yeah, we'll have to, we'll have to connect up. Um, but you go to these shows and you like walk by these booths and like every single packaging company wants to talk about how sustainable they are. And, and it's probably true. They probably have a level of sustainability that is their marketing angle, but that doesn't mean that's the right sustainability for every single brand. And so having somebody, I think that can help navigate those waters is really critical, whether they're hired, you know, chief sustainability officers, um, or they're contracted out or a combination of both, I think is really, really critical. So I'm, I'm glad for your work and, and what you're doing. And hopefully you get, you get some people who reach out to you uh, from, from the packaging side of things. And I think, you know, you hit a really good point too, right? It's like, not, it's not just the fact that you don't, just because someone else is doing one thing doesn't mean you have to do it. And it's really right for your brand. I really feel that it, it happens a lot where someone will see something on Instagram or like, we want to do this exact thing. Can we replicate it? It's like, well, no, because sustainability is very personal and it's, it's, it's about authenticity to some degree. Cause people, again, that goes into the greenwashing sort of language, but I would say, you know, not just figure out what's right for you, but also understand that maybe what you want, maybe not what consumers necessarily can understand as well. So I'm just going to give you an example of something that I was talking about earlier this week. So someone I know in the, in the packaging world was talking about how she has a a client that, you know, has to have a glass bottle for like a a dropper, kind of like a serum type situation. Everything had to be like glass. Like they had to remove like all these little teeny pieces of plastic that come as part of this primary packaging. And, you know, because glass is sort of seen as the most sustainable material. And ultimately I'm like, well, actually in that scenario, it's not because glass is not valuable in recycling, in the recycling world right now. Mm -hmm. It would be better to make something of like that same thing in a monoplastic so you could just toss the whole thing into the recycling bin without having to worry. And that's like the most sustainable option. And if it's a monoplastic, um, that's a virgin monoplastic that that has a chance to be recycled and actually be made into something else that might still be the better option than going with glass. And so it really comes down to what, if your consumers are demanding glass, okay, I understand that. But if they're not, and you want to push a different narrative that is a different branding, like that makes more sense for some companies. Yeah. Yeah. It, and, and again, it, it does cycle back to what, what are the goals and objectives? So Obviously, if your goal is we are really passionate about removing plastic from the environment, we don't want anything in the oceans, we don't want any microplastics in our food, we don't want plastics anywhere. If that's your goal, then yeah, you you should be authentic to that goal and not use plastics. But understand your other materials you may be choosing contribute potentially contribute anywhere from five to 10 X more to greenhouse gas, gas emissions and carbon dioxide. So it's like just through the energy creation and the supply chain and and glass is really heavy as an example. So it's, it's that idea of you need, we collectively define what it is you're trying to do and then go and do that and keep that true North. Because I put this up as probably one of my most engaging LinkedIn posts which I said, I can tell you what is wrong with every single quote, sustainable packaging option. I will give you all the reasons why it's bad. There is no silver bullet other than go out of business and stop making products. That would be the silver, like you're, you're going to make, no, you're, yep. you know, like you're not going to make any impact. But because of that, you'll always have detractors from whatever it is that you decide to do. So you have to be resolved in what you're trying to do, understand what you're trying to accomplish, set up metrics to know whether or not you're winning or losing when it comes to that, and then go forward. If you decide to shift, then you got to redo the whole thing again. But this kind of like whack-a-mole of sustainability that people try to get into is, it's not, I don't think it's super useful for a lot of brands. Yeah. And I mean, what you just said about like capturing that capturing that data too is really valuable. Like 
I didn't think I would love data as much as I, I do now, uh, back, back when I was studying, but I think that it is one of the best ways to like really understand what the future is for your company and also just under having a different lens into what's happening in supply chain, having a different lens into, okay, if I'm going to look at my sustainability, sustainability marketed product versus my conventional product, you, you can test that out and like try to capture data on like what sells more, what sells faster. There's no reason why, um, I definitely encourage some of my small businesses to do that because they do have that flexibility. And usually they notice that their sustainability market product or sustainable market product um, does perform better. Mm -hmm. And, but it's also about being really thoughtful about it. And, and like you said, being resolved because you have to take that resolve to your suppliers. And sometimes they, again, like you said, they want the gig, they want the deal. So they're going to kind of tell you whatever you want to hear so that they can get the job, but you have to make sure, you know, and have someone kind of in your back pocket, help you ask those questions and really understand like, okay, is this, um, is this tested for certain things? Um, what is the difference between, you know, like for example, you can't have something that's 100% recycled cotton. It's not possible because there's always gonna be some kind of virgin cotton in the mix there to actually support that, like that bag or that shirt or whatever it is. But if you didn't know that and someone's telling you that it's 100% recycled cotton, okay, that sounds great, but that's not possible. And there's then there's hmm. that, it's, a, it's an interesting world. Um, and that's What's why I always thing? say, have a, have a, have a buddy. <laughs> Yeah, no, no doubt. Have a, have a climate buddy. That's in, I did not know that about cotton. Are, are there other little interesting tidbits that you've picked up along the way that people, like I get asked sometimes, well, we just, we want it to be compostable, biodegradable and recyclable. What can you, and it's like, uh, I've literally gotten the request. I want it to be like edible like whatever, I want the plastic to be edible so that it's zero waste or something. And it was like the design of the product was, it was impossible. Like that was, it's never going to happen. Yeah. Um, no, I would say, you know, first off, I think people really argue a lot about paper versus plastic and like the impact and technically paper has a more intense life cycle analysis than plastic, but you know, it's whatever lens you, you look at it. And again, it goes back to what's the goal here. Um, but I would say like, there are certain, you know, like an EVA versus, uh, an acrylic or like certain kinds of plastics are better than others. Just, just because they don't have BPA in them, or they don't have certain processes that are used or like bamboo. There's actually a law in the United States that you, they, you have to say that something is 100% from bamboo lyocell, if it's a, like a, like if this was made from bamboo, it has to say it's 100% bamboo lyocell hmm. because, um, or bamboo viscous, I'm sorry, because obviously this isn't from 100% bamboo. They didn't just like put the bamboo in a machine and it just made it this fabric. Right. And there's a difference between like a bamboo viscous and a bamboo lyocell and how that is processed and technically the bamboo lyocell is better for the environment whereas a bamboo viscous is more like a polyester like that process so got it it's like it's all these like little nuances and um but you know it's 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 a part of again the bigger picture of how do you want to communicate sustainability and it makes it tough on consumers to decide what is right yeah. and what is wrong no doubt so let me we'll kind of start ending the, the interview here because I've got just a couple more questions. So the first is we sort of talked about high level business strategy around sustainability and packaging. And we could, we could talk a lot about that. Uh, Corey Connors, who I believe you've connected up with on Clubhouse has a sustainable packaging podcast. He does a great job with that. But as individuals, what, what do you think are some things that we can do to to kind of move the needle individually, even though it, one person isn't going to change the entire world. But I think collectively, there are things that we can do to help drive uh, corporate behavior 
to align with goals and objectives. So what are some of those things that you think we could be doing today as consumers? Well, I'm going to give you the first one, the easiest one, and probably everyone's favorite is just going to be engage with your favorite brands on Instagram, which you're probably already doing, but they really listen to their consumers. Most companies are really taking that into consideration. I will use like wheat straw plastic as an example. I had a client that um, was using, was using it and consumers just hate wheat straw plastic. They see it as greenwashing, even though I think my professional opinion, I would say, I think it's a pretty great material um, compared to others, but consumers don't like it and they communicate that on Instagram. And so then companies be like, no, 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 we can't, can't use that. We're going to use something else. Um, or if something's designed poorly, consumers will say mm -hmm. it on Instagram. They're like, why is this designed this way? This sucks, blah, blah, blah. And they listen, they really do. And so I would say, follow your favorite brands or follow the brands that you don't like their packaging and engage with them, send them a DM. They listen. And that is really where we can all get started and getting involved. And then like, it feels good when you see that change in design, the next iteration, yeah. you kind of like, wow, okay. I kind of think I did that. <laughs> and you go out to all your friends at brunch, guys, uh, you know, Zara just changed this whole thing because I sent them a DM, no big deal. <laughs> <laughs> not a big deal, but Zara really likes me. I one time, <laughs> this had nothing to do with sustainability, but I checked out, I got a drink at a Starbucks in San Diego, but it was in like an Albertsons and I got my receipt and I got an extra shot of espresso. And it said, uh, it was like 35 or 50 cents, whatever the charge was, Expresso, E-X-P-R-E-S-S-O. And I was like, somebody's making this decision misspelled this and I was I like walked up and I was like excuse me you cannot charge me for something that does not exist and they were like I'm sorry I'm like you charge me for espresso they're like yeah you got an extra shot I'm like it's espresso with an s not an x and uh you guys should change it and they gave me the number like I literally chased this thing all the way up through like Albertson's corporate and then the next time I went in there sure enough e-s-p-r I was you like did I've, it. I've made a difference I've made a grammatical <laughs> difference in espresso versus espresso. Oh my gosh. It was, it was ridiculous. Um, that's, well, that's the cool. power of, uh, the power of sticking up for what's right, Adam. That is yeah, right But there. I do think, Perfect I do example. think that like Instagram in, and Facebook and, you know, wherever TikTok or whatever it is, like does provide consumers with greater access, Twitter, greater access to the brand. Um, I think that's a great point. Is, is there anything else that you would say like, yeah, this would be a great suggestion for people to help make climate cool again? I would say, and this is a funny one, before you make like a, a purchase that's like over $50, wait 48 hours. Right. Because so much of what we buy like, you know, you just go into Target or something and you see something you're like, oh, that would be so, that'd be nice. I kind of want to just throw that in my basket, throw this, whatever. And, you know, a lot of times you just don't need that. You, you don't need it. And if you just wait two days, if you still want it after two days, then get it, go ahead. But you probably aren't going to forget about it after two days and then you didn't really need it. And that's consumerism to some degree. It's like save yeah. money, save the planet. You know what I'm saying? No doubt. And, and Dave Ramsey is right there with you. They're like the financial people are like, yeah, that's a great suggestion, <laughs> but it does make a huge difference because our consumeristic behavior is driving a significant amount of the global warming and the climate crisis is just the fact that we can't stop buying things <laughs> <laughs> and then, and then we either hoard it or we have to get rid of it somehow. Yeah. And it's, it's that end of life of a lot of the products. Um, not even so much the packaging. Uh, I mean, packaging does play a role in it, but I think landfills are only, it's, it's something like 10% of landfills are, are, is packaging. The rest of it is, you know, other, the stuff that we buy, the products that we buy, um, food waste and, and things of that nature. So, I'm not saying the packaging is important. It's clearly very important. However, that's such a great point to, to just wait and set, you know, I mean, I would even say like set the limit, whatever is good for your budget, right? There's probably yeah. people who 
you know, $200 is the limit. There's people who it's 25 bucks. Like, I don't know yeah. what the limit is, but man, that's a, uh, these are both firsts for the people of packaging podcasts. We got uh engage on Instagram and some, uh, some financial piece, Dave Ramsey stuff. Uh, but they're both, but they're both so connected to what you do. Right. I mean, I think they're, I think they're awesome answers and I'm ready for you to uh, cover these subjects on your podcast if you haven't already. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think, you know, it's always, I think for me, I always try to think about how does sustainability work for most people? Like, what do we do already that yeah. we can just start implementing sustainability, like in baby steps, easy ways. And if saving money is something that you're thinking about doing, then, okay, this is like super easy for you. If you're already on Instagram, easy. And I would say too, you know, that, as you said, you know, in, consumerism is a huge driver of the negative aspect of climate change. And I would also say it's also the po- one of the positive drivers, just because we do vote with our dollar. Unfortunately, it's like this, you know, like the devil on your shoulder and the angel on your shoulder, like kind mm-hmm. of somehow work together. But I would just say, yeah, pay attention to the brands that you're buying from. And are they talking about, you know, did they do something for Earth Day? Did they, do they even mention it on their Instagram at all? And if they don't, then maybe they're not a great company to really be right. putting money into. When and you let them know, right? I mean, it, you may be the only person and, and they may not pay attention, but if that's the 500th message that they've gotten about it, then it's not going to take much. It's not going to take many, right? Um, it's it's, it's no. going to it's going to happen. Well, uh, those are, those are both great. Uh, Sarah, I want people to be able to engage with you on the social channels. So how do people get more of Sarah Miltenberger? What's the best way to connect up with you? Yeah, absolutely. So the podcast Instagram, which is my main one that I use most of the time is at make climate cool. So you can check me out over there, or if you want to hang out on clubhouse, I run a room every Friday at 3.30 with Anka Novokovic. Novokovic, sorry, I'm totally butchering her last name. She's eco coach. And we talk about how to be a sustainability consultant. And my name is sustainable underscore Sarah over on Clubhouse. And um, what else? You can also email me, Sarah at Make Climate Cool, if you're interested in learning more about sustainability and your own packaging, or if you want to do a training I have a lot of research that I've done. I do a lot of talks. So happy to get involved and, and be a resource for companies that are thinking about learning more. Yeah, that's great. And you've been a you've you've already been a resource for me. Um, I've I've made uh, suggested a couple of companies to reach out to you, and so hopefully there are many more uh, because I I really really value uh, like I mentioned the 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 third party validity or the third party auditing uh, when it comes to sustainable packaging is just, it's so valuable. Um, and it's, it's not only going to save you as a brand from the, the public shaming that could come from your miss from your greenwashing. There are actual like FTC laws against it that you can avoid. Um, but if you properly do it, like you had mentioned, the numbers are pretty are, are pretty clear with Gen Z and millennial buyers, especially that you're you're probably going to be more connected to your buyers, be more connected to their ethos, and drive top line revenue. That's not the goal, obviously, but it's it's a nice it's a nice secondary goal <laughs> for yeah, a brand. One hundred percent. So just like an individual can save money, brands can also you know make money, increase margins and do right by the environment. It's a, it's a, it's a win-win for everybody. So uh, Sarah, I'll make sure that everybody has on the show notes, your Instagram, which is a great Instagram account. Uh, We've recently got connected up there, your clubhouse and also your email. It's been awesome to have you on. I'm excited to dig into your podcast a little bit more and hear about it. I think we need more podcasts. I especially podcasts that are, are aimed at making a difference. So really appreciate you coming online and we will uh, see you on clubhouse. I'm sure at some point very soon. (laughs) Thank you, Adam, so much. I had such a blast chatting with you and always learn something new from your clubhouses and love just being engaged with your community because there's just so much to, to learn and change and everything that we do. And I'm just excited to, you know, hopefully we'll all make 
positive climate change together. We'll make climate cool again. We'll make climate cool again. <laughs> Thanks, there. Thanks, Adam. Well, that is it for another episode of the People of Packaging podcast. Thanks for listening. It would mean so much to us if you would like and share and subscribe to this podcast. We want as many people to know about the incredible people that we have in the packaging industry because we believe that packaging is awesome. Thanks again.